Well, amen. Good morning, church family. Our God is near. Amen. Our God is near. He is moving amongst us. He meets with us as his people gather together. Wasn't that baptism testimony incredible? Right? Did, did you know that uh, Jose and Diane will be 25 and 26 that we have baptized since April? Just in the last three and a half months, God is continuing to move in mighty ways in our midst. All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, we're going to pick up, continue our walk through the book of Acts. I did this a couple weeks ago, but I, I am going to fill in a little bit of what happens. Paul is going to go to Corinth, and we have two letters that Paul wrote to uh, the the church in Corinth. We call them First and Second Corinthians. So I'm going to fill in a little bit of the detail about what happened when Paul was there, um, and, and the sermon's going to have two major emphasis. The first is we're going to look at Paul's life, and we're going to look at the character that God produced in his life. Let me state this. Did you know that character matters? I know in our culture, it's all about winning. It's all about what have you done for me lately? But God cares deeply about character, about transforming us into the image of his son. And that can be painful because when he started, I didn't look very much like Jesus. Now, praise God, through the years I look more and more, but I've still got a long way to go. And so we're going to see how God is transforming and working on Paul's character. And then the other thing we're going to see is that the church in Corinth was a mess. Okay, they were a mess. We're going to get to that. But there's still hope. Above all that messiness, there is still hope. So listen as I read the first 11 verses of chapter 18 out of the book of Acts. So after these things, he, that's Paul, left Athens and went to Corinth. And while he was there, he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded that all the Jews leave Rome. And he came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, And they were working, for they, by trade, were tent makers. And he was, and Paul, that's Paul, and he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And then he left there and he went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, uh, when they had heard, they were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no, harm, uh, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we've gathered around your word. We have sung your praises. We have lifted high your name. And now, Father, we we beg for you to teach us 
and to encourage us, to remind us that you are working all things together for our good and that we can trust you and you see and work towards eternal things. Father, we do confess so many times we we get overwhelmed by our circumstances, but you give strength. You allow us to persevere. You allow us to continue on. And we pray to that end this morning, asking, Father, that you would produce in us a character that causes the world to look at us, your sons and daughters, your local church, and marvel at the virtue that you create in us. We pray to that end in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, go back with me in your mind's eye Back to Acts chapter 16. We're going to walk quickly through a large portion of this second missionary journey that Paul's been on. What has the last six months been like for Paul? If you will recall, maybe you weren't here, that's okay, let me give you a quick summary. If you will recall, after checking on the churches in Galatia, Paul didn't know which way to go next. He wanted to go to Ephesus, but the Lord shut door after door. And there was a little portion where Paul was bouncing around, and we had a sermon on on how do you discern God's will in the midst of just the confusion of life. Well, Paul ended up in Troas, and there in Troas, in the middle of the night, he had a dream, a vision a man from Macedonia was calling out to him and saying, come help us. So finally, right, God had prepared and given direction for the way forward. Now they know where to go. And so they go over to Macedonia and they begin in Philippi. They're a short time in Philippi. Paul and Silas are beaten thrown in prison, and then shortly after that, escorted out of town. Next stop, a three days journey, Thessalonica. They start in the synagogue, as was his regular pattern. He reasons with them for three Sabbaths in a row, but ultimately the synagogue leaders as a whole, they reject the gospel, so he turns to the Gentiles. He actually gains traction. There there are many pagans coming to faith in Thessalonica, even some prominent women in the community. But a short time later, the Jewish synagogue's leaders are jealous of the attention and the traction they're gaining, stir up a mob, and run them out of town. They go to Berea. Again, a three days journey, next town over. In Berea, in the synagogue, for the first time, it says that, that uh, the Jewish synagogue was accepting of the message. It's really positive. They were reading and reasoning with the scripture with them, only to have a short period of time later, those in Thessalonica heard that they had gone to Berea, and they come with another angry mob and run Paul out of town again, this time splitting Paul from Silas and Timothy. He's off on his own. Now Paul, let me remind you, has chronic pain. Remember that thorn in his flesh. He has continual health issues. He has been beaten in prison and prematurely run out of town in every stop in Macedonia. How's that for fulfilling God's vision? Go to Macedonia. So he goes to Athens. And as Daniel detailed for us last week, right, he he probably wants to just lick his wounds in Athens, waiting to be reunited with Silas and Timothy. But while he was there, his spirit was provoked within him. He had to engage the culture. 
So he winds up debating at the Aragapis, but he's openly mocked with very minimal success and again quickly moves on. Now, Daniel closed with a really powerful reminder to us, right? And that is God was faithful through it all, right? God was faithful through it all. That God is going to take Paul's tiny seeds and he would grow it mightily in Athens over the next hundred years. And Philippi and Thessalonica, the churches that were left behind, even though Paul had to leave there prematurely, those churches will flourish. So don't misunderstand the picture I'm painting here. He who sits in heaven laughs at the kings of the earth. The spirit and the gospel will birth the church. But put yourself in Paul's shoes and remember how you deal with physical pain, being misunderstood and unjustly treated, separated from his traveling companions. And on top of that, actually being able to see very little fruit from his labors. When he writes back to the church in Thessalonica, he writes afraid. He says, I was afraid that I had preached the gospel in vain. That after I left, because I was run out of town, that Satan had come in and destroyed everything that I was building. I assure you that when Paul arrives in Corinth alone because he's still waiting to be reunited with Silas and Timothy, that he is weary and that he is almost at his breaking point. Verse 2 tells us that in kindness, God graces him with friends, Aquila and his wife Priscilla. Jews displaced from Rome He too is a tent maker. Now it's unclear if they are already Christians or if Paul will lead them to Christ, but they are a lifeline to the drowning. They take Paul into their home and they will form a bond that will last a lifetime. So now with a place to stay and a companion in the marketplace, Paul finds the strength to, again, begin with the synagogue and reason with them from the Scripture. A short time later, Paul will get another boost of encouragement. Silas and Timothy arrive. Can you imagine what that did to his soul to see his friends again? And this time they arrive with a financial gift that will allow Paul to not have to work as a tent maker in the marketplace, but now he will be able to devote himself full time to reasoning in the synagogue. But with renewed vigor, it is only a matter of time before the synagogue has had enough. Look at verse 6. It says, but when they resisted and reviled him. Now, the Greek here could mean that they uh, blasphemed God, but it probably means that they reviled Paul. They resisted and reviled Paul. And possibly this uh, means that Paul again received a synagogue beating. He's banned from the synagogue and he shakes off the dust of his feet with the judgment of Ezekiel. And Paul turns to the Gentiles. But I can only imagine he's triggered by this. You know, there have been points in his life so far when it says that he despaired of life itself. And now the darkness has returned. Think about this. 
If he received another synagogue beating, if he's run out of another synagogue, but, but just then, Jesus appeared to him again. Just when he was at his breaking point, Jesus appeared again in a dream, but no less memorable. And Jesus' words to Paul, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Right? They were sutures to his lacerated soul. Right? Paul knew all of the right answers. But trial after trial began to push him to the limits of his faith. But now, seeing Jesus again, hearing his voice, being reminded he knows my fears, he is with me, along with a promise that there will be no more attacks in the city, that Paul will finally be able to stay a while and establish the church. And he will stay there for more than a year and a half. Now, I've taken us down Paul's toilsome journey because I want us to see the character that it produces in Paul's life on the other side. That when you read through 1 Corinthians, there is this meekness and humility that comes forth in Paul's writing. A willingness to trust and to wait on the Lord. Even in the most difficult circumstances, will we all say that what Paul has just gone through is more difficult than any trial put together that we have gone through? But listen to the humility as he writes to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 5. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, to this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. And when we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. You see, what becomes apparent when you read Paul's letters is that his character is being molded into the image of Jesus Christ. Pride has been replaced with humility, and trials have made him meek. Paul believes, as James will later write, that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And he is a living testimony of Jesus' statement. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 14, 11. Did you know that God promises grace to the humble? Did you know that the Bible teaches that God is looking, okay, Isaiah 66 verse 2, God is looking for the humble, that he might come along and strengthen and work on behalf of the humble. God is, 
Do you need that in your life? Do you need God looking for you? Do you need God pouring out grace upon you? Do you need that? So how do you know if you're humble? Kind of one of those things that once the moment you think you've arrived at it, then you know you haven't. So I want to give you a quick little test, okay, about what the Bible teaches about humility. You can know if you have genuine humility. But when I, I'm, I'm going to give you eight quick points, okay? But I, I don't want you to think when you are at your best, right, when you're at church and when you got your everything on. I, I want you to think about those that know you at home. I want you to think about at work, with your friends. How do you know you're humble? Number one, the humble place the needs of others before their own. Would your spouse and children say that you put their needs first? Number two, the humble speak life. The Bible has so much instruction about what comes out of our mouth. And simply put, do do your words bring life or do they tear down? Do they edify or insult? Number three, the humble receive correction. Receive correction. The Bible teaches that a wise man will love you for correcting him. But a fool will hate you whenever you correct him. Number four, what it means to be meek. When I say meek, I hope you remember, I've defined this a couple times before, but I want you to think of when a, when a horse has become broken or tame. The, the meek allow the master to steer and to, and to take wherever the master will lead. So number four, the meek will accept trials from God's hand as character forming. So when trials come, you believe and you trust, you say, you know what, God is transforming me into the image of his son, and this is for my good. That's what I see in Paul's writing here, right? As he's going through these incredible trials, trials 10 times more than I have ever endured, and yet he's trusting God on the other side, that's meekness. Number five, in victory, you give God the credit, God the glory. Statements that Paul would write, I I boast only in Jesus Christ and what he has done through me. Number six, the humble guard against pride. You actively guard against pride in your life, and and especially religious pride. Jesus taught a lot about religious pride, wanting to practice your religious righteousness so that others would see you, and the humble will guard against that. Number seven, the humble will seek those forgotten by society, the poor, the foreigner, the widow, the orphan. God has a special place in his heart for those that are marginalized in society and the humble will actively seek them. And the final one, number eight, do you pray? Prayer is acknowledge of your dependence upon God. And so, you cannot say that you are a humble man or woman without examining your prayer life and seeing how much you genuinely display humility and dependence upon God. Now, when Paul was leaving Athens, he was leaving the pinnacle of philosophical learning, right, at the Aragopolis. He, they, they aspired to nobility of thought. But Corinth, however, was the complete opposite. 
It was a city of passion and sensuality, disguised as religion. You see, Corinth was the home of the famed temple of Aphrodite, where a thousand female temple prostitutes enticed worshipers from all over the Roman Empire. Paul, as a conservative, uh, pharisaical Jew, didn't just experience culture shock when he went to Corinth, he experienced morality shock. Corinth was so infamous by its reputation that uh, the Roman world coined a word to Corinthianize to mean practice immorality. I mean, you got to go pretty far to get your own slang term meaning to practice immorality means Corinthianize. And they were selling sensuality, materialism, and on top of that, thousands of slaves. Now, it was an incredibly strategic port city because they controlled the Gulf of Corinth, thereby controlling massive trade that moved east and west. And at a quarter of a million people, This thriving commercial metropolis was the largest city that Paul had yet encountered. So here's the question. Could the gospel take root in such a heavy populated, diverse, sexually obsessed, commercially minded sin city? Could the gospel move there? Well, Paul's friendship with Aquila and Priscilla allowed him to begin his work in Corinth. And once Silas and Timothy show up with their financial support, he's devoted full time to preaching the gospel. But I had pre- as I had previously stated, the synagogue leaders expel him and he will turn to the Gentiles. Now, Even after being expelled, possibly through a flogging, God opens a brazen door for Paul. Catch this. There is a uh, a wealthy, God-fearing Gentile named Titius Justus. Elsewhere, he goes by the name uh, Gaius, who had a large home right next to the synagogue. Okay, right next to the synagogue. And he becomes one of the first converts that Paul has there in Corinth. And he opens up his home for weekly church meetings. So every Sunday, the church is gathered there at Titius Justice's house right next to the synagogue. You think the the synagogue had a few long debated meetings about what we're going to do about this house right next to us? Now, catch this on top of that. Crispus, the synagogue leader who possibly flogged Paul, definitely expelled him from the synagogue, comes to faith. Him and his whole family come to faith. I can only imagine that that God used the circumstances of Paul's character in that expelling to capture his heart. He couldn't get it out of his mind the way that Paul responded, the way that Paul had a passion for what he believed in that mattered enough to take a beating after beating after beating just to tell people the good news. And him and his whole family Come to faith. And so the church in Corinth is off and running. But, but, this will prove to be the messiest church of them all. Reaching such carnal people proved to be a chore and a half. Right? Even with strong leadership, with, with Paul and, and his crew being there for a year and a half, spiritual progress is slow. Unlike Thessalonica, the Corinthian church remained fleshy. How's that for a word? You guys are fleshy, greatly struggling to look any different from their culture 
which was controlled by sensual passions. Paul would write back to them that he longed to give them mature truths, but all they could handle was milk. Like seriously, if you as a church want to feel good about yourself, just read uh, 1 Corinthians, okay? Read how messy 1 Corinthians was, and, and then you can just say, well, we're not that bad. Like really, we're, we're doing pretty good, aren't we? Here's a quick, uh, here's a quick uh, list of some of the prevalent issues. Lawsuits. Okay? They were suing one another. That, that gets pretty heated and argumentative. They, they had a high divorce rate. There was confusion about how they were to interact with culture. Right? Should they be going to local parties where there's idol worship? Woven throughout the entire letter, Paul addresses repeated multiple, multiple sexual issues. All right, they had, they had a member who was openly with his stepmother. And Paul has to address that and say, kick that guy out of here. And on top of that, as if that wasn't enough, they are wildly divided into factions. There are cliques and divisions all through the church. That's woven through the entire letter. In one part, he says, listen, you guys are arguing about who has baptized who. In another section, you you guys are elevating uh, yourself over one another based on who speaks in tongues more than the other. On top of that, there's wild class warfare where, where the The slaves are still incredibly looked down upon. They're they're not given respect as a fellow brother or sister in the Lord. And, And division upon division upon division. And when you boil all of that down, it all of that amounts to pride. Really sounds like a church that you would want to join, right? You show up and and all of this is going on. Right? In summary, we would say that they are minimally better than the culture. That they do not have the character of Christ in them. And they struggle to make an impact. I mean, as you look at the different churches in Ephesus, revival breaks out. Awesome. In Thessalonica, even in heavy persecution, their faith becomes known throughout the whole region. But in Corinth, it's messy. It's messy. So does Paul, does his letter to the Corinthians give us any overarching hope? Okay? Does, does it lift our eyes that gives us hope to say, in that messiness, yes. Now, first, hear me say this. Paul addresses all of these issues. Okay? He addresses them head on. He addresses them with teaching. He doesn't ignore them and just give a pie in the sky answer. He gets in the details and teaches specifically. Stop doing this. Okay? Stop doing that. He goes through all of that. But with that said... In the midst of that mess, did you know that Paul's letter can lift our head above the horizon and point us to something greater? Our our true north, something that we can see, that we can fix our eyes on, that gives each of us hope even in the midst of messiness. Do you know what that is? He defines love. In a culture that would only define love by uh, by sensual passions, just like ours, he defines for them love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is, is one of the greatest pieces of writing in all of human history. That and canon D have to be read and played at every wedding that you attend, right? 
Apparently, Canon D is the greatest song in all of human history in 1 Corinthians 13. Just a little joke. I'm going to read for us 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Maybe it's been a while since you've heard the whole chapter. But before I read it, I, I want to make this point so that you hear it through this lens. Christians are called to define love to their culture. Okay? We are called to display and model genuine love, to possess a character that the world marvels at. Because God has given his son for us in love. So listen as I read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries of all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all of my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account wrongs suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. And if there are tongues, they will cease. And if there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. And when I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then... I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. But now faith, hope, love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Little Chad was a shy, quiet third grader. And one day he came and he told his mom that he would like to make Valentine's for every member of his class. His mom's heart sank. She thought, I really wish she wouldn't do that. You see, she had watched the children as they get off the bus and come home from school, and Chad was always behind them. You see, they laughed and and hugged and hung on each other and talked to each other, but Chad was never included. Nevertheless, she decided to go along with her son. And so she purchased the paper and and the glue and the crayons. And for three whole weeks, night after night, Chad painstakingly made 35 Valentines. Well, Valentine's Day dawned, and Chad was beside himself with excitement. He carefully stacked them up and placed them in his bag and bolted out the door to school. His mom had decided that she needed to ease his pain when he got home, and so she baked him a big pile of cookies and milk. She knew that when he got home, he'd be disappointed, and maybe this would ease his pain a little. It hurt her to think that he wouldn't get any Valentines, maybe none at all that day. So that afternoon, with the cookies and milk on the table, she heard the children get off the bus. She looked out the window, 
And sure enough, as they came, they were laughing and having the best time. And as always, there was Chad in the rear. But today he walked a little faster than usual. She fully expected him to burst into tears as he came through the door. His arms were empty, she noticed, when the door opened. And she held back her own tears. Mommy has some warm cookies for you. But he could hardly hear her words. He just marched right on by, but his face was aglow. And all he could say was, not a one, not a one. Her heart sank. And then he added, I didn't forget one, not a single one. Beloved, our testimony is that our Lord and Savior left the 99 to come find us, the one. And he has poured out a love in our hearts that changes everything. It's time we display and model love to our culture where they will look at it and they will marvel at that sort of love. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, We pause right now to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love for us. Your love changes us. You pursued us when we were far away from you. Your love is so different. It's a never relenting, ever pursuing love. And you've captured our hearts. And Jesus, we long to have your character And to be able to shine your light to those around us. And so we pray right now in your name. Keep establishing that in us. Keep working on us. Keep, keep, keep. We want to walk worthy. We want to shine your light. We know we are a work in progress. And so this morning we say we trust you. In our trials we trust you. We trust you to form humility in us. We trust you to form genuine love for our culture in us. May that ring out from this mount hilltop. Your love and your character in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.